much. Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, I'll give a brief welcome to everybody here. Um, so yeah, welcome back to uh, another virtual Green Bank Observatory 65th Anniversary Colloquium. Um, in these series of talks, we've been exploring some of the great achievements made by the observatory since its formation in 1957, and how all of these varied topics continue to shape the field of astronomy today. My name is Jesse Bublitz, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the observatory. Um, over the course of this series, we will hear from experts in fields in which the GBO telescopes have uh, made significant contributions, discussing both their history and the future role that the observatory will play. Uh, it is my honor to introduce our speaker this week, Dr. Jean-Luc Margot. Um, he is a professor of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences, as well as a professor for the Physics and Astronomy Department at UCLA. There, his group studies uh, planetary and near-Earth object properties, as well as um, a being a member of SETI in their search for techno -sig signatures uh, from intelligent life. His work has included the confirmation back in 2007 that Mercury has a molten core uh, and observations of multi-asteroid systems using a host of optical and radio telescopes. Um, I can only assume how excited you've been about the recent successful impact of DART onto the surface of Dimorphos. But today he'll be talking with us about the use of planetary radar at the Green Bank Observatory uh, to better understand the physical properties of some of our nearest neighbors from moons and planets to naturally asteroids. So let's please give a warm virtual welcome. Um, and when you're ready, uh, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to give this talk today. I'm sorry that I cannot be there in person. I could have, in principle, made it if I would taken a red eye and done a mad dash to the observatory, but uh, didn't think that would be very wise. Um, but I do hope to get back to the site uh, soon. Uh, I'm going to be presenting a talk today, and uh, I've added Patrick Taylor uh, as a co-author because he's been very generous in providing material, but of course all errors and omissions are my responsibility. So on the title slide you can see a radar image of Venus uh, obtained with Arecibo transmitting and the Green Bank uh, telescope receiving. So here's the outline of my talk. I'll talk a little bit about the instruments or observables. Uh, the first science with the Green Bank Telescope, which was actually uh, radar observations, and the accomplishments to date and future prospects. So here's an overview of our instruments. Um, Arecibo until uh, 2020 was the largest uh, and most powerful radar system on Earth. In the middle, we have the DSS-14 70-meter antenna at Goldstone, and then uh, on the right, the 100-meter Green Bank Telescope. And all of these uh, play key roles in planetary radar astronomy. Arecibo had a one megawatt transmitter uh, at 12.6 centimeter wavelength. Uh, also has a 70 centimeter uh, transmitter that I'll mention in some of the science results today. The 70 meter antenna at, Gold, at Goldstone is part of the deep space network. And so its primary job is not to do uh, planetary radar astronomy, it's to track spacecraft. And so um, there's a whole constellation of spacecraft in the solar system. And this uh, azimuth wheel here shows you that any given time at Goldstone, you can observe a variety of spacecraft and the time for radar observations on that telescope um, is, is relatively small in the order of 5% or so. Uh, Goldstone was uh, not quite as sensitive as the Arecibo uh, system about a factor of 15 difference. And when combined with Green Bank as a receiving antenna, we can compare the sensitivities here if we take DSS-14, DSS-14 with a sensitivity of one, 
can see that there's actually a substantial gain by having the GBT as the receiving antenna, about a factor of two in sensitivity. Um, Arecibo was, of course, by Well, it looks like uh, we may have had a brief disconnection. Um, please hold on, folks, while we get to the bottom of this. About a transmitter on a Green Bank. Radar uh, systems are complicated. Here's a sort of a block diagram uh, of a radar system. And it has high power uh, components. So these things can fail. Um, there's a number of electronic uh, stages to filter, amplify the signal, sample the signal. What you're seeing on the right is uh, Shantanu Naidu, a former graduate student in the Arecibo control room. And these racks that you're seeing here correspond to roughly this part of the radar system, including some of the uh, intermediate frequency, amplification, mixing, uh, low pass filters, and so on and so forth. And then uh, on the other side of the control room, uh, there's the rack with our um, data taking equipment. And here's former graduate student. Adam Greenberg in the Arecibo control room. That data taking system um, has, has been installed at the Green Bank Telescope. And some of you may have seen this unsightly um, mix of um, instruments and cables in the GBT control room. It contrasts starkly compared to the very neat, uh, beautifully designed and laid out uh, NRAO equipment. So our apologies for the, for, for the eyesore, uh, but we've used this uh, backend for most of the radar observations over the past uh, 20 years. And um, there were two units at Arecibo, four units at Goldstone, and two units at Green Bank. Um, most of the data I'll be presenting were obtained with this system. There's now a new um, data taking system uh, installed by JPL for radar observations. So radar astronomy is interesting because it's really an experiment in which uh, the observer controls uh, the direction, the amplitude, the frequency, the phase, the polarization, and the time frequency structure of the signal. So there's a lot of um, uh, control that the experimenter has. And the observables uh, are listed here. We can measure time delay to a target and Doppler shift. We can also measure the amount of power that's received and the polarization properties of the echo, including the full Stokes matrix. If we have access to another uh, antenna, we can, in some circumstances, measure the interferometric phase or uh, the space-time correlation function, which I'll talk about later. Now, if here are some of the quantities we can measure with radar, and, and um, radar really excels at measuring velocities, as you know, if you ever got a speeding ticket. Um, here's an example of uh, Green Bank uh, observations with Arecibo. This is the small asteroid uh, 2001 EC16, which is about 150 meter in diameter. And based on the Doppler shift, uh, we can measure its velocity to a precision of about two millimeters per second. Now, near-Earth asteroids travel with velocities of tens of kilometers per second. And so we can make a measurement with a fractional precision of about 10 parts per million. Uh, 10 parts per billion, I'm sorry, 10 to the minus eight. Uh, so su superb uh, precision in velocity measurement. Radar can also measure distances. So we can encode the transmitted waveform and slice the echo in time so that each line in this diagram is a time slice. And within each one of these slices, we can compute a uh, spectrum. So frequency increases to the right and time increases to the bottom here. And that creates a radar image. 
And the echo that stands out here at about 10 standard deviations above the noise is the asteroid 2000 BD19. It's a kilometer sized asteroid um, that I observed in part to place constraints on um, general relativity and the oblateness of the sun. And at the time of this observation, the asteroid was about a quarter of an astronomical unit away. That's about 40 million kilometers away. And the precision on the range measurement is about 400 meters. And so again, about a 10 parts per billion uh, precision on distance. With measurements of velocities and distances, we can measure orbits of all kinds of celestial objects, uh, in, including uh, binary objects that I'll talk about uh, later. There's a technique called radar speckle tracking that allows us to measure the spin orientation and the spin rate of um, certain bodies, primarily Mercury and Venus, with a precision of about 10 parts per million. So it, uh, superb measurements in the spin characterization as well. Radar obviously excels in measuring the morphology of uh, some of our celestial neighbors. Uh, here's an image of the asteroid 2000 ET70. Um, there's really no other Earth-based instrument or capability that can give us this level of detail. Uh, the only other uh, approach is really to have a spacecraft fly by. So radar images reveal uh, the structure of these bodies and with a collection of these images, we can reconstruct the three-dimensional shape of an object. So this is the so-called dog bone asteroid to, uh, to 216 Cleopatra. It's a main belt asteroid about uh, 200 kilometers in, in size um, with uh, you know, metallic-like uh, properties and a, and a porous regolith. And these are based on Arecibo observations. With uh, the interferometer uh, that I mentioned earlier, we can recover the phase and measure topographic maps. Here's an example of the uh, Tycho crater on the surface of the moon, where the topo map is, has a precision of about 30 meters in the vertical uh, direction. And in principle, we can also measure uh, surface change, either from changes in topography or changes in the appearance of the target. Because we can uh, receive the echo in two different polarizations, we can also learn about surface properties, in particular the roughness of the terrain. Uh, so this diagram shows the radar albedo or cross-section in two separate polarization, the same sense circular polarization as that transmitted, and the opposite sense uh, circular polarization as that transmitted. And you'll see that for silicate surfaces, terrestrial planets, uh, the dominant echo is the opposite sense circular polarization, which is what you would expect from reflection at a fairly um, specular or flat interface. However, for icy satellites, uh, the opposite is true. The same sense circular polarization is uh, usually stronger, and that's because the radar wave in that case penetrates into the ice, undergoes a number of forward scattering events, and emerges with the sense of polarization preserved. And there's also a coherent backscatter effect that can, um, where the wave propagates in the opposite direction along the same path, and these two uh, contributions reinforce one another. So by measuring the amount of same sense versus opposite sense circular polarization, we can infer something about the surface. Um, and also because, uh, the same sense circular polarization can be generated by wavelength scale structure on the surface. So we learn about the surf, the roughness of the surface, the amount of wavelength sized rocks on the surface by measuring these kinds of uh, properties. Now for truly specular echoes, this is a, a, a specular echo measured uh, by Don Campbell and collaborators. Um, we can also infer the dielectric constant based on the strength of the echo and uh, knowledge that it comes from a specular reflection. Now, dielectric constant is related to near surface density, uh, especially in 
in regolith type materials, there's a good correspondence be between the two. Um, so we can infer something about the near surface density of the material. And finally, we can measure, uh, we can learn about composition. Um, here's an example of the circular polarization ratio. So the ratio of the powers in these two polarizations for a variety of asteroids. And based on their taxonomic types, you see that there's uh, a clear trend with the E-type asteroids, for instance, having particularly high circular polarization ratios. Composition is also uh, observed in this image by John Harmon. Um, this is an image of the pole of polar region of Mercury, where the circular polarization ratio was near unity uh, and the backscatter uh, in the same sense, polarization was strong, indicating uh, the presence of ice and that forward scattering mechanism that I mentioned. And so um, the discovery of polar deposits in the permanently shadowed craters um, of Mercury was one of the great discoveries enabled by radar observations. And then finally, we can uh, learn a lot about interior properties. I'll talk about binary asteroids where we can measure uh, the, the motion of the secondary with respect to the primary and learn about the mass of the total system. And in fact, we can learn about the masses of the individual components. Um, we have shape models based on radar observations and with mass and shape, we can infer bulk density. And in some situations, we can also infer moments of inertia, in particular, in the case of tumbling asteroids, where the rotational dynamics are dictated by the distribution of mass and the moments of inertia. So I've just described the whole array of dynamical, morphological, uh, surface, and interior properties that uh, radar measurements are really good at obtaining. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit more about how we obtain these radar images. Um, this diagram on the left is, is modified from a diagram initially made by Nick Stacy. And it shows the uh, celestial object you're trying to Im image, the radar direction. Here's the sub radar point. Uh, this is the apparent rotation axis. And as you uh, encode your waveform and get resolution in the range direction, you have uh, annuli of constant range from the observer uh, shown as uh, concentric annuli over here. And that those are shown by individual lines in these two radar images. So the image on top was an Arecibo Green Bank image of Venus. The image at the bottom is an image of the moon that I obtained with Arecibo and the VLB antenna in St. Croix. So each line here represents an annulus of constant de delay or range from the observer. Now, if Within each one of these lines that you have resolved in range, you perform a Fourier transform, you can learn about the frequency spread of the signal. And this diagram illustrates the fact that some points are moving away from you due to the rotation of the object, some points are moving towards you. And the locus of constant frequency is shown here. It's also an annulus. And at the intersection of the annuli of constant range and constant Doppler, uh, you can then measure the power. So any one of these uh, pixels here is um, the intersection of these two. Now there's some complications because they're in fact two points that have the same range and Doppler frequency from the radar or from the observer. And that is sometimes noticeable um, in uh, some images of Venus, for instance. Um, for the moon, that problem can be uh, almost entirely avoided because you can isolate one of the hemisphere uh, with the beam of the telescope. Speaking of which, here is the uh, first null of the primary beam, and it illustrates beautifully the fact that radar images are not limited to the diffraction limit of the telescope. We can do much, much better than the diffraction limit because you obviously see the structure uh, and the detail in this image within one beam. Now, I want you to uh, focus on these two craters down here. They're a 30 kilometer and 20 kilometer crater. I'm going to zoom in on these two craters, again, showing that we can obtain maps at uh, superb spatial resolution. 
this is a map of the South Pole of the Moon. And another thing that's worth pointing out is that some of this terrain here is never illuminated by the sun. Radar provides its own source of illumination. So we've been able to map uh, real estate in the solar system that's really never been seen other than in radar images. If you have an interferometer, as I mentioned earlier, you then have a pattern of interferometric fringes that are painted uh, on the sky. And these can also intersect with any given uh, delay Doppler line. And you can, with the interferometer, you can measure that phase. And that gives you information about the third dimension and you can obtain a topographic map of the surface. And this is really what led to the very first scientific observations with the Green Bank Telescope. Um, Don Campbell and I had uh, been working on obtaining topographic maps of the moon as part of my PhD work. And uh, Don was really eager to apply this technique to Maxwell as well. So here's a, a Magellan image of the emissivity of Venus, where clearly there's some regions with extremely low emissivity, extremely high reflect reflectivity that are not fully understood. And some of the hypotheses involve elevation of the terrain. And so Don was really excited about using Arecibo and Green Bank in an interferometer configuration to derive uh, the height of some of these uh, terrains um, with much better resolution than the Magellan spacecraft had been able to do. The, the altimeter footprint for Magellan was tens of kilometers. And with Arecibo and Green Bank, we calculated that we could get topo maps with maybe a kilometer resolution or so. So we, um, there was a conjunction of Venus uh, that was approaching at the time that the Green Bank Telescope was uh, commissioning. Um, that put a little bit of pressure on everyone to get things organized, uh, put some pressure on me to get the data taking system finalized and uh, installed at Green Bank. Uh, but we, we did uh, get there. Uh, Don was at Arecibo and I was at Green Bank. Um, and on the you know, March 24th, 2001, um, was to be your first observation, first radar observation uh, with uh, the Green Bank Telescope and the first science observations with the Green Bank Telescope. Um, and as far as I know, and I've inquired with uh, NRAO colleagues and uh, the archivist, um, Green Bank was really the first radar observations at the site. Um, so on that day, it was windy at the GBT. We had no internet, so we had to do uh, uh, coordination over the phone, uh, but things worked. And here's the image that we obtained that day of Venus. Uh, now it looks a little peculiar because um, the Venus is what we call um, an overspread target at 12.6 centimeter wavelength, which means that it's not possible to obtain an image of the target without some aliasing uh, in frequency and some overlap in the range dimension. So uh, the, the code that we were using is something like 32 milliseconds long, but the delay depth of Venus is something like 40 milliseconds. And so what you're seeing uh, at the top here is in fact the back of the planet that wraps around because we can only accommodate 32 milliseconds and uh, Venus is 40 milliseconds deep. Um, now, if you have a code that's 30 millisecond, 32 milliseconds long, you can sample the echo about 30 times per second. Well, that's not quite enough because the bandwidth of uh, Venus at that time uh, was probably on the order of 33 Hertz. And so you're sampling a signal in a, inadequately, uh, you're not meeting the Nyquist sampling rate and there's going to be some aliasing uh, in the frequency. In fact, there's the uh, folding frequency here and you can see the limb um, alias there. But nevertheless, uh, the, the imaging was successful and um, there was shortly thereafter, there was a press release uh, written that focused on the Maxwell region. And in fact, they cropped the uh, the front part of the planet that was wrapped around um, to make it to make it prettier. Uh, 
So that was the origin of uh, radar at Green Bank. And we did uh, succeed in obtaining uh, interferometric fringes, but um, one of uh, the great frustrations uh, for me to this day is that the signal to noise ratio was just a little bit too low to be able to uh, analyze these uh, this French pattern and produce a topographic map. So we were just shy, maybe an order of two um, of, or so in, in signal to noise, um, away from being able to uh, unwrap all the phase and create a topo map of Maxwell. Um, the next day, or um, maybe two days later, uh, we conducted the second uh, observation, science observations at the GBT. And this is the asteroid 2001 EC16 uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and it illustrates the real importance of having GBT as a receiving antenna, because this asteroid was uh, 15 seconds uh, round trip light time away at the time of the observations. And with Arecibo in a monostatic configuration, it takes about five seconds to change from the transmit mode to receive. You can't transmit and receive at the same time. So the effective span of the data is 15 seconds minus five seconds, it's 10 seconds. And with that, you can get a frequency resolution of 0.1 Hertz. Well, look at the bandwidth of this asteroid. Uh, it's much less than 0.1 Hertz. And so in the Arecibo data, this asteroid is completely unresolved. You just see a spike, but you have no idea about uh, the bandwidth or the rotation state. With Green Bank, we were able to transmit continuously from Arecibo, receive for a longer time span, and get uh, Fourier spectra with higher frequency resolution. And we're able to measure the actual bandwidth of this asteroid and infer that it's actually a fairly slow rotator for um, you know, 150 meter asteroid. It's uh, somewhat unusual in, in the general distribution, um, diameter period distribution of asteroids. So an interesting uh, uh, asteroid here observed at Green Bank. So while I'm on the topic of asteroids, I want to describe uh, why they're uh, important and why radar observations are important. Um, they're essentially important in four contexts. One, we want to get a better understanding of uh, scientific understanding of the population and the dynamics uh, of these objects. There's a really rich set of uh, dynamics that we can trace back to um, fundamental processes and the evolution of the solar system. Asteroids play an important role in uh, the impact hazard, which is a natural hazard that can in principle wipe out civilization. So we, we'd like to understand it better. And radar plays a key role in uh, mitigating that uh, hazard. There's almost certainly going to be uh, manned explorations uh, of near-Earth asteroids, uh, perhaps in preparation for um, other destinations in the solar system. So we, we want to take advantage of what the radar observations can tell us about these objects. And presumably in the future, there'll also be uh, extraction of resources for near-Earth asteroids. And for all of these applications, you really want to get the best possible information about these asteroids. And this is where radar really shines. Um, it is superb in improving the trajectory uh, determination for these objects, as well as the physical characterization um, of these bodies. This is um, images of the uh, asteroid 1999 JM8, a slowly non-principal axis rotator uh, that was um, published by Lance Benner in 2008. So here's why radar is so good. Uh, the fractional precision I mentioned is something like uh, 10 parts per billion in range in some cases. Uh, that's orders of magnitude better than the best optical um, observations. And not only that, it's also orthogonal to an optical measurement. So if you combine line of sight measurements provided by the radar with um, plane of sky optical measurements, you can really dramatically improve uh, the knowledge of an, as uh, an asteroid's trajectory, including the reliable interval uh, for a trajectory prediction. So without radar, you can typically predict for 90 years with 50 years in the future. And if you add radar, 
uh, typically that interval is multiplied by a factor of four with uh, 200 years uh, into the future. So that's you know, orders of magnitude improvement in the knowledge of the orbital parameters of these objects. The uh, precision is so good that you have to be very careful when you model the trajectory, you have to include all kinds of uh, minute effects in order to truly capture uh, the trajectory of these objects. This is work done by John Giorgini for a potentially uh, Earth impacting uh, asteroid. And the risk is being retired, so we we're not uh, particularly worried about it. Um, but here are some of the physical effects that affect the trajectory. And what uh, John first illuminated was that the Yurkovsky effect uh, is in fact the largest source of uncertainty in the prediction of the trajectories of kilometer-sized asteroids and below. And the Yarkovsky effect uh, is described here. It's a non-gravitational force that is due to the uh, non-isotropic uh, re-radiation of sunlight from an asteroid. So sun heats up the asteroid, there's a thermal lag, some of the photons are re-emitted in a, in a non-central uh, direction, and that provides a little thrust that can change the semi-major axis uh, of the asteroid, either expanded or contracted. Um, confirmation of that uh, proposed effect was obtained with radar observations. Here are the predictions without the Yarkovsky effect, and here's the prediction adding uh, the Yarkovsky uh, prediction and the Arecibo astrometry within the error bars of that prediction. This is done uh, by Steve Chesley et al. in two, 2003. Now, since then, we've obtained um, Yarkovsky drift measurements, drift rate measurements shown here on the vertical axis for something like 250 asteroids and plotted as a function of diameter. We we're able to verify the expected size dependence of the object and do statistical studies uh, on, on this uh, physical effect. Also, we've been able to show that the uh, uncertainties really decrease rapidly if you have uh, radar observations. So it's about a factor of two improvement in uncertainty for every radar observation. Here's how the uh, Yarkovsky effect scales as a function of physical quantities. Here's the diameter and the density in the, num in the denominator. Um, Everything else is known about this object. There's luminosity of the sun, the mass of the sun, speed of light, uh, semi-major axis and eccentricity, which are known. Um, and we've uh, quantified this effect with a so-called Yarkovsky efficiency, which represents the uh, efficiency of converting solar uh, energy into orbital energy, essentially, solar radiative energy into an orbital energy change. And uh, with that sample that I just mentioned, we are able to show that the efficiency of the Yarkovsky effect is about 12% in converting solar energy into orbital energy. Now let's uh, move on to some of the other aspects. These are not uh, green bank data, but I will show uh, green bank data in a minute. Uh, these are, again, examples of uh, near-Earth asteroid images obtained at 15-meter resolution, and with a collection of such images, you can infer uh, the shape of the object and also contribute, uh, compute its uh, gravitational environment. This was work done by uh, Shantan and Naidu. In the case of binary asteroids, um, we can obtain not only measurements of the sizes and shapes of the individual components, um, but also obviously a measurement of the orbital period, the semi-major axis of the binary orbit from which we get the mass of the system. Um, this particular asteroid is about 800 meter in diameter, the primary, uh, secondary is about 150 meter uh, in diameter. And the orbit would fit just um, the separation between these two would fit. Um, you could put the Golden Gate Bridge in between the two. That's about the span between these two objects. Um, the radar is so precise that we can actually 
measure the reflex motion of the primary as the secondary revolves around it or as they both revolve around the common center of mass. And this is illustrated here uh, where we varied the mass ratio, the primary to secondary mass ratio and are able to pinpoint uh, the fraction of the mass that belongs to the primary and the fraction that belongs to the secondary. So it's almost 96% primary and, and about 4% secondary. And that turns out to be the same uh, based on our shape model. So the volume is also about 96% primary and 4% secondary, indicating that they are about the same density and uh, likely formed from the same material, which we've postulated for a while. Um, here's another uh, example, the first um, detailed characterization of a binary asteroid um, done by Steve Ostro and colleagues, where uh, we were able to measure the spin rate of the asteroid to something like 1%, the mass of the system to something like 2%, and the volume to 9%, and therefore density to about 10%. Um, and it dramatically changed the understanding of, of binary asteroids uh, and had a big impact and continues to do so in the, in the asteroid community. So as I mentioned, we've, we've known for a while that these asteroid uh, binaries were formed of the same material because uh, the first few that we observed were all observed to be fast rotating spheroids. Um, and we postulated that the formation mechanism was a spin up. Um, essentially, when the primary spins too fast, uh, mass is ejected, and some of that mass can end up as a satellite in orbit around the primary. And the spin-up mechanism is uh, called YORP. It's a cousin of the Yarkovsky effect. It's also caused by anisotropic re-radiation of sunlight that can um, modify the spin of an asteroid. So if you shine light on a propeller, it will start spinning. And the same thing happens to small asteroids. And this uh, result here by Patrick Taylor and collaborators uh, shows the uh, quadratic increase in the rotational phase of an asteroid uh, it was based in part on light curve observations, but also on uh, the radar shape model for this asteroid, which was critical in, in modeling the phase response. If we have um, detailed shapes and detailed orbital information uh, for the primary and secondary, we can then um, model the spin dynamics. And there's a whole host of interesting uh, dynamical effects that happen um, here's a phase map showing the spin rate at pericenter and the orientation of the long axis at pericenter in different um, behaviors, including uh, spin orbit resonance with large librations of the secondary, uh, but there are also chaotic regions. And um, these chaotic regions can persist for a very long time. It, it, once the object enters that zone, it's very hard to get it out of it. Uh, and we've uh, postulated that uh, some of these binary asteroids are synchronous. We've observed that, but that some of them are not. And um, if they're not, they may be in this chaotic uh, regime, in which case their evolution is sort of stopped, uh, whereas objects in a synchronous rotation state can, in principle, evolve due to tides and, and the so-called binary Yorp effect. So lots of dynamics can be explored. All right. so. Uh, here's some GBT images, Green Bank images of a binary asteroid. So all the signs that I've described earlier can be done uh, with uh, these images from Green Bank. Uh, this particular object was at three lunar distances in 2015 when it was uh, observed with Goldstone transmitting and a superb resolution of about four meters. Uh, this primary is about 350 meters and the secondary in 70 about 70 meters. So don't be fooled by the extent along the horizontal axis, the Doppler axis, because that is dictated in part by the spin rate of the object, right? So this primary is a fast spinning primary. The secondary is a slowly spinning uh, rotator in part because it gets tidally locked, uh, at least for some of these binary asteroids, it gets tidally locked to the orbital period. And so the span on the horizontal axis does not convey the size, but the span on the vertical axis is a better indicated, indicator of the relative size. Um, 
Patrick Taylor also shared this uh, beautiful image of uh, what appears to be an equal mass or nearly equal mass binary asteroid uh, obtained at Green Bank. Uh, this is 2017 YE5. These objects are extremely rare. We've observed lots and lots of binary asteroids. About one in six uh, near-Earth asteroid is a binary asteroid, but we only have a very few examples uh, of these equal size binaries. So uh, wonderful data set there to allow us to uh, try to understand the formation of these objects better. Here's another example of green bank observations with uh, Goldstone at the top at X band at 3.5 centimeter wavelength and about four meter resolution and Arecibo to Green Bank at the bottom with um, uh, S band and about eight meter resolution. Uh, this particular object was observed at seven lunar distances. It's, it's long and elongated. It's two kilometers in size roughly. And it appears to be a tumbling asteroid. So it has a primary period of about 12 days but there's probably uh, another period and the asteroid is uh, constantly reorienting itself. Um, so uh, there's lots of potential for uh, asteroid observations with uh, GBT. Here's a, a, a sort of a diagram showing the history of the number of detections as a function of time. Uh, the two breaks in the curve here are shown when, when there was the Arecibo upgrade of the S-band transmitter. That was a big change in the discovery rate. And then the second break in the slope was when the funding was increased from the Near Earth Observation Program, which allowed uh, more observations to be conducted. So there's uh, lots of asteroids out there um, with interesting scientific questions, and uh, there's going to be a continuing potential for doing observations of asteroids. Let me move on to an object that is at one lunar distance, that's the moon. Um, and these are observations of the circular polarization ratio that I mentioned earlier uh, of regions of the moon uh, done by uh, Don Campbell and collaborators. And the goal here was to uh, try to assess this claim that there's polar deposits uh, in the craters of the moon. And what Don showed is that the circular polarization ratio increase uh, was seen not only in high latitudes, but also at mid latitudes. And that effectively ruled out the possibility that these uh, were only due to uh, ice deposits, but that uh, essentially rock abundance and wavelength scale structure could explain these circular polarization ratios. These circular polarization ratios have also been used to uh, look at the geology of the regolith of the moon, and in particular, the mapping of uh, periclastic deposits. This is work done by Lynn Carter et al. Um, so what's illustrated here is the different modes of uh, backscattering. You can have specular scattering from the surface. You can also have specular scattering from a fairly flat facet in the subsurface. And then you can have diffuse scattering from um, rocks on the surface, wavelength scale structures on the surface or in the subsurface. Um, and Lynn used this uh, knowledge and these observations to her advantage to identify uh, periclastic deposits, which are thought to be fairly uh, transparent to the radar wave and fairly devoid of large rocks. And so these regions of particularly low uh, circular polarization ratios um, can uh, inform us about uh, the location of these pyroclastic deposits, which are not necessarily uh, detectable from infrared or optical images. Likewise, uh, Bruce Campbell has done mapping of the moon at 70 centimeter wavelength, these beautiful images here uh, of the moon. And the radar wave penetrates on the order of 10 wavelengths. And so this is an opportunity to probe the regolith at depth and understand about the structure and the composition of the regolith, including uh, the history of uh, emplacement of lava flows and um, uh, some of the compositions uh, in these individual lava flows. So uh, here's an example of an optical image on the left and the corresponding 70 centimeter image on the right where uh, Bruce was able to uh, infer uh, a lot about the history of the uh, emplacement of these uh, flows that are obviously not apparent from uh, the optical images. Uh, Jean-Luc, a quick reminder yes. about the time. 
All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna switch gears and talk uh, now about radar speckle tracking and the measurement of spin properties and interior properties. So in this technique, we uh, generally transmit from the Goldstone 70 meter antenna at three and a half centimeter wavelength. And we receive at Goldstone, but we also receive with the 100 meter Green Bank telescope, which is located uh, about 2000 miles away, 3000 kilometers away. And what we are observing, um, we transmit a monochromatic continuous wave. What we are observing is the reflection from thousands of scatterers on the surface of the body, it could be uh, Mercury or Venus. And the important uh, aspect to remember is that the contributions from these uh, scatterers, they all contribute uh, amplitude and phase, just all add up and it's a complex sum. And so the echo is speckled, as you can see here, the echo power as a function of time has these variations. But these are not random variations. They're deterministic because they're determined by the location and the cross sections of all these scatterers. And these locations don't change as the object rotates. And therefore, the same speckle pattern is observed uh, a few seconds later um, at Green Bank. So what I'm showing here is the trajectory of the speckle pattern as it sweeps over the surface of the Earth. Uh, here's the speckle pattern observed at Goldstone. And in green, the speckle pattern, which I've translated by uh, 10 to 20 seconds to line it up to show you that the echoes at these two independent telescopes is strongly correlated. And that's because the speckles um, produce the same signature at both, except for receiver noise, obviously. And we can then cross correlate uh, these time series and obtain really precise information about the spin uh, state of the object, not only its orientation, which depends on the time of day at which the speckles line up with uh, the telescope baseline, but also about the spin rate of the object, which depends on how long it takes for these speckles to travel from one antenna to the next. So here are some examples correlation. The, the black lines here are actual data and the red are Gaussians that I fitted to the data. Um, superb correlation um, as a function of time here that tells us the time of day at which this correlation happens, which tells us the orientation of the spin axis. And this is time lag during that correlation epoch that tells us how fast the object is spinning. So with these observations, we've been able to show that Mercury is in a Cassini state, Cassini state one, which is a stable rotational state. Um, and in that state, there's a strong relationship between the moment of inertia and uh, the obliquity of the planet. So uh, our solution for the spin axis orientation is shown here. Uh, the location of the Cassini state is shown here and the obliquity, the difference between the orbit pole and the spin pole tells us about the moments of inertia. And for Mercury, we are also, we're able to measure variations in the spin state shown here. And I've folded them here as a function of days from perihelion passage. And you can see a very clear uh, signature, small variations in the spin state of Mercury. Um, and we can fit this with a one free parameter model. Uh, which is shown here, this is the libration of Mercury that is expected from the solar torques on the asymmetric uh, figure of Mercury. And the only parameter that's fitted for here is the amplitude of that curve. Everything else is determined by theory. Um, the amplitude of that libration tells us about the moment of inertia of the layer participating in the librations. And based on these observations, we were able to show that Mercury has a molten core. Um, there's no ambiguity um, with that large lamp, uh, libration amplitude. The only explanation is that the core of Mercury is molten, um, which previously was not known because there are different explanations for the magnetic field that can involve uh, a solid or a molten core. Based on these moments of inertia, we've been able uh, for the first time to produce uh, density profiles uh, and pressure profiles in the interior of Mercury. And that's been really satisfying in terms of understanding the interior structure of that planet. Um, we've done the same thing uh, with Venus just recently. 
Uh, our solution here uh, for the spin axis orientation of Venus is shown in black, uh, and it's compared to the very best Magellan observations in red and blue. So we've in increased the knowledge of the spin axis orientation by about an order of magnitude in each dimension compared to the very best spacecraft estimates. This is with Goldstone and GBT. And we've also been able to um, measure the precession of the spin axis of Venus, the changes in the orientation of Venus as a function of time. And that tells us about the moment of inertia of Venus. So we have a measurement uh, with about 7% fractional uncertainties for the moment of inertia of Venus. And we're going to continue these measurements and uh, improve uh, that value. I want to finish about uh, some notes about Venus. Uh, Bruce and Don Campbell have argued that long-term imaging of Venus is important for a variety of reasons, including measuring potential surface change uh, that could reveal volcanic activity, uh, long-term spin rate monitoring of the planet, and also radar polarimetry to better prepare us for some of the uh, uh, instruments that will be uh, flying with uh, the future missions to Venus. Back to uh, speckle tracking, it's also possible to do that for the Galilean satellites, although at much lower signal to noise ratio. So you can see the correlation scores here are much, much lower for Europa. Um, and that's in due, due to the part, in part to the fact that signal to noise decreases at the fourth power of distance. But nevertheless, it is repeatable. We've detected this correlation uh, for Europa and Ganymede. And here's our uh, map of constraints for the orientation of Europa. It's nowhere near as precise as uh, Mercury or Venus, but it actually uh, does give us important constraints on the orientation of Europa and Ganymede, the spin axis orientation, which has never been measured. It also happens to lie on the Cassini state uh, locus. And again, we can use that relationship between the obliquity in a Cassini state and the moment of inertia. And what we find is that the moment of inertia of um, um, Europa actually implies a decoupled shell. So this is a strong, independent, dynamical argument for the uh, presence of a subsurface ocean at Europa with an icy shell uh, decoupled at, at the top. I want to finish by uh, talking about the very exciting prospect of a uh, radar transmitter on the GBT. Um, here are some uh, preliminary uh, images from a prototype um, built uh, in uh, conjunction with Raytheon um, and some test images that they were able to obtain for uh, uh, regions on the moon. Uh, these are superb images at five meter resolution. Uh, here's Tycho Crater again. Um, and um, lots of possibilities um, that could um, arise from having an actual transmitter capability. I should point out this is a fairly uh, low, trans low power transmitter at the moment, but there are studies and uh, Patrick Taylor can tell you a lot more about uh, the trade studies that are going on right now about putting a high power transmitter on Green Bank and um, taking advantage of this great uh, facility and instrument to uh, push science in, in new and interesting directions. So I'll stop here. Um, Green Bank has obviously enabled lots of uh, interesting studies about trajectory, spin state surfaces, morphologies, interiors of all kinds of solar system bodies. And there's a lot of promise for the future, especially with a new transmitter. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Jean-Luc. Um, let's give him a nice virtual round of applause. And um, with uh, a bit of time remaining, uh, let's go and answer some questions. So if you have any questions, go ahead and um, enter them into the Q&A, uh, or you can raise your hand and I'll um, unmute you. So we do actually have uh, one question in the queue right now, um, which is, could Aumuamua be explained as one of your extreme shaped asteroids? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> there are elongated objects out there and the shape of Oumuamua, which is not that well known, by the way, there's, you know, uh, light curves and interpretation of light curves. Uh, these kinds of elongations are uh, entirely expected and uh, 
uh, and similar ones have been observed in, in the near Earth population. So we don't need to invoke uh, any kind of uh, uh, strange uh, process to explain the shape uh, of this object. It doesn't have to be uh, built by an advanced civilization. <laughs> All right. Um, another question that just came in, what is the highest practical frequency slash wavelength for astronomical radar observations from the ground? Well, uh, one consideration is the accuracy of the surface, right? So you need a, you need a dish that uh, is smooth uh, uh, to a fraction of the wavelength. Um, so that's one of the practical considerations that has limited radar observations so far, but there's plans for K-band, uh, obviously. I mean, ultimately, if you move to even higher frequencies, you're going to run into some of the absorption lines in the atmosphere. Um, so I think K-band is a great, great place to, to start. Um, I don't I don't know if it would be possible to do it at higher frequencies at the moment. Well, those those opportunities are always available. Um, all right, and a question from Jay Lockman. Will the new radar system on the GBT allow the study of more solar system objects that can be studied, then can be studied right now? I, I wonder if Jay means uh, more distant or... Um, so there's going to be newly discovered asteroids. Obviously, those will be uh, detectable. Uh, with increased sensitivity, the volume uh, of of detectability increases substantially. So certainly the number of asteroids that could be detectable is going to increase. Uh, depending on the bistatic configuration that, that is being used, uh, you could potentially reach out to uh, you know, main belt asteroids that have not been uh, imaged with radar or some of the moons of Jupiter uh, or Saturn. Um, you know, Arecibo has the had this two and a half hour limit on transmit receive time, which put a constraint on how well we could do at Titan, for instance, because it takes two hours for the signal to get there and back. So if you had a bistatic configuration, uh, you could, uh, in principle, do much better uh, with some of these uh, distant objects. Okay. Um, I'm curious, have you found any particular um, correlation with uh, feasibility to um, observe these objects via radar with uh, their composition, such as, you know, a carbon rich or a silicon rich. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the Galilean satellites that I mentioned, they are detectable in part because they're covered in ice. Uh, Io is not detectable because it's silicate essentially, right? So um, the, the composition and the reflectivity definitely uh, affect the, the detectability of these objects. Right. So there will admittedly be some biases in what is detected. Uh, true. So if, we, you know, uh, one of the exciting prospects would be to detect more metallic type asteroids, mm. right? And those are easier to detect than the rock, the rock type. So that, that would play in your favor. Okay. All right, and uh, another question that came in, could ALMA be configured for radar transmission uh, with multiple antenna, antenna transmitters? It's a curious question. In, in principle, yes. Uh, whether there'd be any you know, political will to make that happen is, is a different <laughs> question. The, one of the challenges with transmitting from an array um, is that you have to somehow phase the uh, the transmissions, um, and I I think that's a technical challenge. It may not be impossible to solve, but it's a it's a more challenging proposition than having a transmitter, a single transmitter, and receiving with an array. So it's it's, um, it's possible in principle. Uh, I uh, I think you know when when we actually implement it, we'll we'll have to see how well it works. Um, but you have to somehow phase uh, the transmitter um, from all these individual elements. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, since we're just past the hour, uh, I wanted to ask you one last softball question, uh, which is, do you have a favorite object? <laughs> 
at the moment, I'm really passionate about Venus um, <laughs> because there's so much interesting science about it. It's, uh, you know, it's the planet most similar to Earth in terms of mass, size, density, and yet there's so many things we don't know. Uh, the size of the core, we don't even know if the core is molten or, or solid, and the models can accommodate both. Um, so much to learn about Venus. Um, and so I'm really excited about the prospect of additional ground-based observations, but also about the spacecraft missions um, that will be visiting Venus in you know, mm -hmm. the next few years. Excellent. Um, and yeah, one more comment question from AC in the chat. So no phased array astronomical radar for now, it um, seems. Well, I, I mean, it's... <laughs> I don't know if they don't exist. It's possible that some um, agency has these working right now. Um, it's entirely possible. I, I, I don't know of any, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. So I, I think it's possible to do. Um, I just think as a scientific community, we haven't done it yet. Which just means that it's the next big field <laughs> for everyone that wants to jump on it right now. Pioneer the science. All right. Well, with that, um, I want to thank you one final time, Jean-Luc, for joining us today. Um, and thank you, audience, for uh, listening in. Uh, please join us next week for a talk on the technological evolution of millimeter wave astronomy at the GPO by Dr. Phil Jewell. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. <laughs>